This, this committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. This hearing is entitled the National Flood Insurance Program, Oversight of Superstorm Sandy Claims. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the witness for appearing today, Mr. Kieseman, and we'll look forward to his testimony. I'll now recognize myself for two minutes to give an opening statement. In October 2012, Superstorm Sandy made landfall, damaging or destroying 650,000 residences and resulting in $65 billion in losses. Years later, the media reported initial causes of fraudulent engineering reports that facilitated lower flood insurance claims. FEMA acted, but only after public prodding, and today is in the midst of a significant legal battle, attempting to settle as many cases as possible. Still, no one has been able to tell Congress or the public why these engineering firms operate in the fraudulent manner in which they are believed to have done. One question must examine is whether or not to pres that perverse incentives exist within the National Flood Insurance Program. Sandy wasn't the first test of the NFIP and, unfortunately, won't be the last. The fraudulent reports and alleged underpayment claims that came in the wake of Sandy highlight a significant underlying issue. Reform of NFIP is needed and is needed now. Today we hear from Brad Kaiserman, FEMA's Deputy Associate Administrator for Insurance, an individual charged with overseeing the Sandy Settlements Claims process. It's my hope that he will be able to be forthcoming in his testimony and that he will provide the subcommittee with a better understanding of the events that occurred following Sandy. Time and again, we've seen Americans suffer because of government's failures, particularly when it comes to the National Flood Insurance Program. At this moment, what we know is that there was negligence and alleged fraud on the part of FEMA, and certain engineering firms and the policyholders were mistreated. Today, we aim to garner more support, excuse me, garner more information on this situation, examine whether or not such significant issues have presented themselves in the wake of similar disasters, and begin to discuss ways to fix a broken system in an effort to ensure it does more to benefit not only policyholders, but also the taxpayers who foot much of the bill. Right now. Okay, the chair then, uh, that's the end of my uh, opening statement. The chair recognizes uh, the gentlelady from uh, New York, uh, Ms. Velasquez, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and ranking member for convening this important hearing. Superstorm Sandy was one of the worst natural disasters in U.S. history and hit homeowners especially hard. From completely destroyed homes to thousands of flooded basements, this storm wreaked havoc in my district, causing millions of dollars in damage. In the face of such devastation, my constituents expe expected write-on insurance companies to honestly and fairly assess damages and pay claims. Unfortunately, it appears that did not happen. Mounting evidence suggests that peer-reviewed engineering reports were ordered to specifically deny claims, citing, citing that the damage was due to prior long-standing problems, even though the original report stated Sandy was the cause. In, in other more egregious cases, reports were falsified to indicate no structural damage occurred at all, when in fact it did exist. The allegations at the heart of today's hearing falsified engineering reports, underpayment of claims, and lax oversight by FEMA paint a troubling picture that led to significant harm for many victims that rightfully thought they were covered. We owe it to the victims to thoroughly investigate what FEMA knew, when they knew it, and what is being done to fix the problem. But most importantly, ensure it never happens again. Today's hearing will further that goal. And with that, I thank the Chairman and the Ranking Member, and I yield back. Thanks, the gentlelady. With that, we go to the uh, gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Garrett, for uh, two minutes. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank you for conducting this important hearing, allowing us the opportunity to oversee the process of making those affected by Superstorm Sandy whole. You know, I was able to personally help some of those who suffered from the storm personally able to help to dig out of the rubble, if you will. So I saw the destruction and I saw the devastation firsthand of the storm. And I also saw the despair of the victims. But at the same time, I also saw the strength and the determination of my constituents who worked hard to rebuild their homes and to rebuild their lives. But after enduring the storm and the cleanup and all that went with it, 
The people of New Jersey then had to face yet another challenge. Some doctored flood insurance claims that threatened their ability to rebuild. This, quite frankly, is unacceptable. Frankly, it is actually maddening, and I hope that we can work together to ensure that victims are not cheated and taken advantage of. And of course, importantly, we need to also make sure that the taxpayer is also taken into consideration for overpayments of Sandy and of waste and fraud. And with that, I again thank the uh, Chairman for hearing and look forward to discussion of how we can best serve those who are continuing to rebuild. I yield back. We thank the gentleman. With that, we go to the ranking member, the gentleman from Missouri, for uh, two minutes, uh, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the chair for the hearing. As many in this room know, Superstorm Sandy, which hit the United States in October of 2012, is estimated to, be, to have been the second costliest hurricane in U.S. history. It damaged 650,000 homes and resulted in $65 billion in damages. Of the 144,000 insurance claims that have been filed, 2,800 were appealed. Now, because I have a boring life, last night I watched uh, the 60-minute uh, episode uh, on the um, investigation of charges that many of the insurance claims were underpaid or doctored by engineering firms. A number of news stories have further echoed the same charge. In light of these grave claims, it is paramount that this subcommittee hold a hearing to determine the severity of these allegations to assess FEMA's role or lack thereof in overseeing the or write your own flood policy and to discuss the, that how FEMA will reassess these claims and restructure their policy, policies in light of these uh, allegations. Uh, my congressional district was not uh, impacted by Superstorm Sandy. Uh, Mother Nature, however, does not discriminate, not by city, by district, or by red and blue. As a member of this committee, it is our responsibility to ensure that when disaster strikes, our constituents have the resources to rebuild in ways that allows them to move forward with their lives. I look forward to hearing from you, Mr. Uh, uh, Director, and hope hopefully many of the issues that we have uh, can be resolved. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. With that, we have the, uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I especially thank you and the ranking member for this hearing because, as you know, on Memorial Day in Texas, we had an inundation. And literally, we have had trillions, trillions of gallons of water um, in Texas. And uh, my congressional district in Houston, Texas, has been hit. We have uh, one apartment complex, the uh, Rockport Apartments, where hundreds of people have had to be relocated. Some of the units are uninhabitable. And we also have had an area in my district with homes that have been flooded to the extent that people are losing everything that they have on the first floor. Whatever they had on the first floor, <clears throat> I think, is lost. I've actually gone to them. I've been in their homes. I've seen it with my own eyes. And my hope is that we'll be able to bring some resolution to the issue of concern today, because we don't want to see other persons visited with these same concerns, especially when they are suffering and uh, are expecting um, a helping hand, a hand up, not uh, some, some person who's going to defraud them. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the witness for appearing today as well. We thank the gentleman. Uh, today, we welcome the testimony of Mr. Brad Kaiserman, Deputy Associate Administrator for Insurance, Federal Emergency Management Administration. Mr. Kaiserman, you'll be recognized for five minutes to give your oral presentation or testimony. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. And with that, we're recognized to proceed. Mr. Kaiserman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman Luke Meyer, Ranking Member Cleaver, and members of the committee. Uh, as you know, I am Brad Kaiserman, the Deputy Associate Administrator for Federal Insurance in the Department of Homeland Security's Federal Emergency Management Agency. I am grateful for the opportunity to be here today, but I'll be honest with you, I'm regretful about the circumstances. Congressman Green, your comments resonated with me. Um, I will tell you why in particular. I have been very focused on Texas over the last uh, week or so, uh, along with my, uh, my colleague, uh, Deputy Associate Administrator Wright, who is here behind me. And there's a personal reason why. 
1972, my grandparents, Ben and Bertha Levy, lived in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, when that community was devastated by Hurricane Agnes and the flooding associated with it. While the floodwaters did not kill my grandparents, the experience afterwards did. I was 10 years old. I've had a lot of opportunity, unfortunately, to think about that and remember it since Sandy and over the last 114 days since I have been in this job. Because about 120 days ago, the administrator of FEMA, Craig Fugate, came to me and said, we have a problem, I need you to go solve it for me. Many people ask me what happened in Sandy. I think what happened is fairly simple to describe, but painful. There are, many, there are some people in Sandy, survivors of Sandy, people who paid premiums, some for many years, for flood insurance. And they did not get what they were entitled to. They did not get what they deserved. Their government let them down, their insurance company let them down, and people came to their homes. And some of those people did wrong by those survivors. There's a lot of talk about why it happened. Uh, people want to talk about the incentive structure that's in place. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you very fulfilling answers on that today, but I will tell you why I think this happened. Why I think this happened is because the National Flood Insurance Program needs to be reformed. It has lost contact, it has lost connection with its survivors, with its customers, with its policyholders, with its premium pay payers. And I will tell you this, floods are the number one disaster in this country. You don't have to look any further than Texas, sir, to see that. And they continue to be the number one natural disaster in this country. And as long as that is the case, Americans will need flood insurance to help manage their risk. And they deserve a program that they can count on. And over the past 32 years since we put into place the public-private partnership that is the Write Your Own program in which commercial insurance companies deliver about 83 percent of the services in the National Flood Insurance Program, we have allowed that program to grow to be a highly distributed network. It really lacks adequate governance. And we have lost the capability and capacity to detect and monitor problems in that program. And here's the proof of that. Two years after Sandy, two years after Sandy, a federal court judge finally sat down in writing that he had seen reprehensible gamesmanship on the part of some people delivering the program and that he expressed concern that that may represent systemic wrongdoing in the program. It shouldn't take two years to recognize that. And it should never take two years to recognize that again. There's a great book about organizational change. It's called Your Iceberg is Melting. It's written by Dr. John Cotter. The National Flood Insurance, Pro Pro the National Flood Insurance Program iceberg is melting. And what we saw in Sandy was the tip of it. And the numbers don't tell the whole story, but let me talk about the numbers for just a moment. We had 144,000 claims for insurance filed in Sandy. We paid out $8 billion. Of those, we had about 3%, 3 4% of the people filed appeals to FEMA disagreeing with what their insurance company gave them, 3%. Another 1.5% ultimately sued their insurance company or FEMA. And so you could say, well, those numbers indicate that the problem's not that big, there's not really a serious issue. But the problem, the, those numbers don't tell the whole story. Those numbers are just the tip of the iceberg that's melting. And those numbers represent individual people like my grandparents, the Levies, and like some of our litigants, the Morellos, the Ramies, and others that, Congressman, you saw in 60 Minutes. And for those people, this inability to detect their problem and react to it in a timely way devastated their lives. And we cannot allow that to happen again. And so we are settling claims, we are reviewing claims, and we are going to reform this program. I should inform the committee in my final seconds here that, uh, before I take your questions, uh, that I have tendered my resignation. Uh, I will be leaving FEMA on the, 13th of on the 12th of June. I have accepted a position with the American Red Cross uh, to be the Vice President for Operations and Logistics. It was literally an opportunity I, I couldn't afford to decline. I care deeply about the work that the task force is doing. The Administrator, the Secretary, the Deputy Administrator of FEMA are deeply committed to this, and Mr. Wright, who is behind me, will take the helm at the Federal Insurance and Mitigation Administration, and he will drive forward to lead these reforms and to lead this change. I look forward to taking the committee's questions today. And again, I thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Kaiserman.
appreciate your testimony today. And with that, I will begin the questioning and, and uh, acknowledge myself for five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, you said that the percentage of Sandy claims that remain, I guess that were in litigation, the people that weren't happy was about one and a half percent? That's correct, Congressman. Uh, what, what percent are, how many are left of that, uh, that you've got resolved? So we have, we currently had, we began with 2,200 claims in litigation uh, in, uh, in the fall of 2014. Um, we are down to about 900 claims in New York and about 1,100 claims in New Jersey. Of those, through the settlement process that we began about 110 days ago, um, we have tentatively settled 60 percent of the cases in New York and 40 percent of the cases in New Jersey. My goal and expectation is that uh, FEMA will be able to offer every litigant in New York and New Jersey uh, who was in litigation as of February when we began this process with a fair and reasonable settlement by the end of August of this year and that those who wish to litigate after that will certainly have the opportunity to do so, but our goal is to offer every litigant a fair and reasonable settlement, and we're well on our way to doing that. With regards to, uh, to the settlements, um, uh, because some of the fraud allegations and realization of it came to light after some of the, some of the folks probably had their claims settled, do they have uh, the ability to go back and get uh, further restitution for their, their claim, or, or they have to present a, a situation where they believe they were defrauded and then show that they can uh, have just cause to uh, be considered for some, some further uh, payment. So How's it, that work? How's it going to work? I guess is the question you'd ask. It, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis, and it depends on the release that they executed and where their settlement was at the time that this process began. Uh, there were about 400 or so cases that had been mediated um, w with plaintiffs and defense attorneys and a mediator, and, and folks agreed to, to the settlement of claims prior to our initiation of the process. Uh, if they sign a release of all claims, then, then they are complete with the process. A um, number of those cases had not been finalized at the time our process began, and so we're moving forward to treat them within the scope of the process. What, what do you, you know, when you made the comment, <clears throat> you know, it, it looks like, um, quite frankly, rats off a sinking ship here with as many people leaving uh, FEMA as they are and the, and, the, and the flood program here. We're concerned that uh, with this lack of leadership leaving, uh, Maybe the bad apples are leaving, but maybe the, the folks who just don't want to deal with it are, are taking leave and leaving the, the ship without a, some folks to, to man the rudder here and, and con, kind of concerned about the direction of the program. Uh, what do you see? You said that it lacks, the program lacks governance. Can you explain that and how that's going to be impacted by all the folks that are leaving, including yourself? So I, I guess I would begin uh, by saying that uh, uh, my departure is motivated by nothing other than the fact that I have, uh, I have one son in out-of-state tuition at, at the University of Michigan and another son who dropped out of college and dropped back in. Uh, so I am putting two boys <laughs> through school at the same time. Uh, I have been in, uh, in federal service for nearly 29 years, and uh, I, I need to look after my family. Um, uh, I'm not leaving for any other reason. Uh, I, I'm very dedicated to Secretary Johnson, Administrator Fugate, and uh, Deputy Administrator Nimick, and I'm very committed to this program, and I'm going to the Red Cross so I can keep helping people. Mr. Wright, who is behind me, uh, is, uh, is an outstanding senior executive. Okay. Uh, he, but my question was, you made the statement that the program lets governance. Yeah. We're losing some people. You said it needs reform. So tell us how, what, what your suggestions are going to be, or would be, uh, for reforming it and giving that governance that you, you testified yourself that it needs. So I think we need to begin from the premise that, that governance needs to focus on customer service and governance needs to put the survivor first. So we need to figure out, first of all, the structure of the Write Your Own program and the structure of how FEMA administers its policies on the direct side, frankly, is an anachronism to me. So I think we're going to have to look at that from a forensic accounting perspective and understand the various layers that have accrued during the years. For example, there are 82 write-your-own companies plus FEMA. Between FEMA and one of those other write-your-own companies, we have about 35 to 40 percent of all of the policies in force in the United States, 5.3 million total policies. Two entities have 35 to 40 percent of those, and then 81 entities have the balance of the 60, 65 percent. That business model intuitively doesn't make sense. Why can two handle 20 percent or 40 percent, and then you have 81 to do the rest? That is, a, that is a business model that was allowed to grow over the years, and as that business model has grown, what's happened is that many of the write-your-own companies and FEMA have contracted out 
for these services because i have to tell you this is a contract program there is no one out there wearing a fema shirt or a u s government employee shirt who is adjusting a claim there is no one out there providing engineering services who is wearing a government who is a government employee all of that is contracted for so this is fundamentally going to be a contractual relationship if you want to have the capacity and capability and professionals in the field. So the question becomes, how do you govern that network of contract professionals in a way that is survivor-centric? Because flood insurance is, is, is another emergency management program where it has to focus on the survivor. I won't have to interrupt you. My time is up. If you see the little red button on there, you, you probably need to start winding up your, your comments because otherwise I've got the gavel. Um, with that, let me uh, turn to the ranking member, Mr. Cleaver from Missouri, for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for uh, your service uh, with, with uh, FEMA. I'm sure it hasn't been uh, all uh, roses, and, but thank you uh, nevertheless. Uh, I was born and raised in Texas, following up on what Mr. Queen earlier said, and uh, <coughs> having uh, going to high school in, in Wichita Falls, it's, it's um, hard to imagine that uh, there was mandatory evacuation. My father uh, lived in an area that didn't have to be evacuated during this flooding, but all around him. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled over the fact that, uh, that the flooding didn't hit him because he didn't have any uh, flood insurance, and probably most of the people in Wichita Falls, not one of the great places of, of flooding, uh, would have uh, insurance. And uh, Mark Hanna uh, of the Insurance Council of Texas has said that he believes less than half of the homeowners, half of them, have flood insurance. So uh, why is it that you think most uh, people in this area uh, lack uh, flood insurance, uh, even though this is not you know, it's not a place that's going to be hit often, but do you have a, any, any idea of, uh, on why? So flood insurance, uh, the purchase of flood insurance, Congressman, is only mandatory in the special flood hazard area, an area that's mapped for a particular hazard. Outside that, it's not mandatory. However, it's interesting, uh, nearly 25 percent of the claims we pay come from people who are outside that mandatory purchase area. So why don't people buy flood insurance? I suspect it's for the same reason um, that people don't wear seat belts uh, and, um, and, and take other risks in life. They look at the cost-benefit analysis, uh, probably not unlike my grandparents in 1972, and they assess what they believe their risk of flood is and whether they want to pay out the premium every month. And so I think that's one of the reasons that people don't buy flood insurance. Uh, but even, uh, even if they do, there seems, there's something wrong with the way insurance companies uh, process claims. Uh, I was on this committee when uh, Katrina hit, and a number of us, uh, I think Mr. Green, was, we, we went into the area, we held hearings down uh, in New Orleans and in Mississippi. Uh, Senator Trent Lott's house, I stood on, his, on the stoop of his house. That was the only thing remaining. The same thing with Congressman Gene Green uh, was the stoop. N nothing else was there. And I think many members of Congress were, were completely outraged that these two individuals were denied uh, the, the, the uh, insurance company uh, protection from the flood because all of a sudden uh, the insurance company was one of the biggest in the country, said, well, I'm sorry, sir, we, that we can't play the, pay this claim. Uh, you have flood insurance and your house was not washed away, it was blown away. Um, so should we have blow away insurance? I mean, I, I, I'm trying to. I mean, what, something is not right. Um, I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I, I'm accusing uh, the, the not right uh, scenario that, that's being played out again and again and again after disasters. Uh, what do you have to say to that? Congressman, uh, the, uh, the, there's a line drawing exercise that I've observed as you have. In Katrina, it was wind versus water. In Sandy, it was earth movement versus flood damage. I have to tell you, um, I don't think we're particularly good at drawing those lines. Um, and I've seen many cases in just working the Sandy cases alone uh, where one professionally licensed engineer will come in and say that the damage was caused by flood and another will come in and say it was caused by earth movement or, as Congressman Velasquez said, uh, by pre-existing damage. Um, my, my experience with this is any time we try to draw those lines, 
Um, we don't always get it right, and we end up with very frustrated customers. And the other thing I would share with you is many people don't understand the insurance coverage they bought. We need to do a better job helping them understand the product, because it, the, the flood insurance product is a subsidized product, and it doesn't cover everything. It has a what lot of What can we do with insurance companies to, to, to hold them more, uh, uh, hold them accountable uh, for all of these problems that exist after major tragedies? I think insurance companies have to understand and acknowledge the role that they played in Sandy and, and where things went wrong there, and I think they can be part of the solution as well. And I think to the point I made earlier about better governance in the network, how do we hold those companies, adjusters, agents, bankers, others who communicate with policyholders more accountable for helping them understand what they are buying and what their risk is. We all have to do a better job at risk communication, and I think there is a number of interventions we can take there. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. With that, we go to the uh, gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Garrett, for five minutes. Thank you. Um, besides the insurance companies, um, I have heard reports, I will just throw it out whether it is true or not, that there are engineering firms as well that are accused of doing wrongdoing. Um, if they, engineering firms, have been found to act improperly, if they doctored reports or do anything else like that, um, then they obviously not only have victimized the government, but I fair to say that they victimized the um, Sandy victims as well. You would agree? Yes, Congressman. Right. What is the status, briefly, uh, of those cases right now? And do you know is there a history with those particular firms that you're looking that you're going to speak of of this sort of thing? So, Congressman, I would begin by saying that FEMA is neither a law enforcement agency nor a regulatory agency, and I think it is imperative to understand the role that we play here. Okay. We, we, deliver, we deliver a flood insurance program, and some of the participants in that program have engaged at a minimum in highly irregular practices, and I will leave it to the courts and criminal investigators to determine okay. whether they violated the law. The New York State Attorney General's Office and the New Jersey Attorney General's Office are investigating very aggressively, I might add, at least two of the engineer firms. Um, and do, is there a history of, with these firms in the, in the system, so to speak? Uh, there are those who say that there is prior misconduct, and again, I, I think that it is uh, it's up to those who say that to prove it. But what I can say is that uh, the president, at least of one of those firms, uh, was disbarred from the practice of law uh, for allegedly being involved in the commission of fraud. That firm and that individual should never have been allowed to participate. So who is responsible? Uh, so he is responsible for his own conduct. Who is responsible here in the government? for making sure that people who have been disbarred or have a history of it not be allowed to be in this um, system that we have? Today, Congressman, I am responsible for that in the National Flood Insurance Program. It is for that reason that uh, we have withdrawn the authority of insurance companies uh, to make any allocation. Should or that have been done by someone, you or otherwise, before Sandy occurred, making sure that if there is a list of bad actors, that these bad actors should not be allowed to be involved? I think first you have to detect it before you can deal with it, to my earlier point about the need to build in better governance and the well, ability to detect that, and that's, monitor this problem. Yeah, that's what I must asking. In other words, yeah. did these folks that we see now are bad guys? Did, we have a, did they have a history that we should have known before that these were bad guys? I think we should have had mechanisms in place to know that there were problems and to know, first of all, that the companies were not necessarily run by reputable people, and second of all, to identify the problems long before a Federal judge had to tell us about it. I think both of those things should have happened and need to be done. So when the judge, and I didn't read the judge's opinion, I'm just going by your quotes here, says that there was systemic wrongdoing and reprehensible conduct. I assume, I'm guessing here, that the systemic wrongdoing involves not only these bad guys, the bad engineers and the uh, claims adjusters or anybody else, but systemic sounds like there's a systemic problem with the flood insurance program as well this one point that we didn't look at for the last several decades to see who the bad guys are. So he's talking about there's a systemic problem in the system, right? That is my understanding, and that's certainly how I approached it when I took the job. Right. And, and, and so when you talked about the issues of, well, they were just bringing up, well, there's certain cases there's wind damage, certain times there's earth movements, other times there's pre-existing. You know, these are, these are problems that we've heard repeatedly after storm after storm after storm, and yet here we are again in 2015. You know, the, the common denom I'm trying to figure out what the common denominator is. We know there's always going to be bad actors in the world. That's one common, den actor, common denominator. But the other common denominator is, is FEMA um, and the flood insurance program in general. Um, that's the common denominator over 
storm after storm after storm, decade after decade after decade, and as the judge calls it, a systemic problem, that seems to be where the, the problem is. And it, we've had these hearings before, we've reformed before, and we just come back again, time and time again, with the same systemic problem. So, Congressman, I'd say that the common denominator to emergency management in this country is FEMA, and that FEMA helps millions and millions of people every year, and no one should forget that. Sure. I think that it is absolutely the case that the National Flood Insurance Program needs to be reformed. And I would tell you, back to my, my analogy about the iceberg melting, there's a lot of people in an insurance business and in the banking business and in and other businesses who would tell you there's nothing wrong. This is a small number of claims. I'm not sitting here telling you that today, and neither is Administrator Fugate or Deputy Associate Administrator Wright. We are absolutely acknowledging that this iceberg is melting. We're seeing the tip of it, and it needs to change. But I need this body, and we need others to help maintain that sense of urgency around this issue. Otherwise, it will just slip back again. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, next <clears throat> up for questions, Ms. Blaskez, the gentlelady from New York. For Thank five you, minutes. Mr. Chairman. Uh, sir, I hear that you admitted that FEMA knew or should have known that there were claims of underpayment and fraud as early as 2013. That's correct, Congresswoman. So here you are, you said that FEMA is not an enforcer and FEMA is not a regulator. But what do you do when you made a statement like this that you knew since 2013? So what do you do? I think you do three things. You offer people a fair and reasonable settlement in litigation because they should have never had to sue you to get what they're entitled to. You open up the process and you offer people the opportunity, the 142,000 people who didn't sue us, and sue the right your own companies, you offer them the opportunity to have their claims reviewed because given what's come to light, they should have that opportunity if they choose to. And then finally, I think you set a, a course in motion to reform the program and to reform it permanently so that we don't continue to go through this cycle. I but think what do you do with the right your own participants? I How do you hold them accountable? How do you send a strong message that we are not going to allow this type of behavior to ever happen again? So I think there's a number of steps. The first was taking control of the litigation. Normally in, in the litigation process, the right your owns make the decision, FEMA pays all the money. We've took, taken control of litigation, we're settling claims, and we're doing that in ways that probably the right your owns would prefer we didn't, but we're doing it that way anyway. I would also say that the other thing we have to do with the right your owns is try to make those who are willing be part of the solution because we will never have the capacity as a federal government to deliver an insurance program to 5.3 million Americans. We're going to need the insurance industry to help us with that. So I think we have to, we have to set a standard. We have to uh, set a culture of being survivor-centric. And I think we have to be careful uh, not to alienate the very people who we need to deliver the program. Well, but we need to send a strong message to those in the industry. So what type of stiffer penalties can we put in place to hold them accountable? So, Congressman, I think that there's a, I think the first thing we have to recognize is that before we start penalizing uh, anyone, there's court proceedings that are going on and investigations going on. And so I didn't wait for those. We didn't wait for those to conclude in order to try to compensate survivors through litigation and through claims. But I do think it's imperative to get to dispassionate facts about who did what and what really happened. And okay. so for now, what I have done is, uh, yes, ma'am, thank okay, you. Okay, I have other questions. In March, FEMA announced that they will reopen all 144,000 uh, Sandy-related flood insurance claims for review. And while this is good news, many homeowners at the time may not have taken advantage of other federal recovery programs like SBA disaster loans with a reasonable assumption that their insurance will be honored. In light of the fraud allegations, should we reopen other forms of assistance for those that thought they were covered by insurance were denied and missed out on applying for a loan? Congressman, I think that's a question for, for SBA uh, and uh, to the extent that it involves grants for HUD and its grantees. Uh, from my perspective, we believe there was a sufficient basis to provide people the opportunity to have their insurance claims reviewed, and that's what we're doing. It is our understanding that FEMA and SBA have worked out a way to avoid the duplication of benefits uh, issue 
using a joint checks model. However, SBA was not the only entity providing assistance after Sandy. Will FEMA work with the New York City to replicate that model to expedite and lessen the burden resulting from overpayments to homeowners from the city? The, the CD, we, we have worked with New York City, with New York State, and with New Jersey State, and we will continue to do so. But everyone should understand that a grantor like New York City and New York State and New Jersey stands in different shoes than a loan maker like SBA. Uh, policyholders assign their rights to policy proceeds to SBA so that SBA has a secured interest. That is not the case for the grant makers. So I would say that if anybody took uh, an SBA loan, we are working with SBA, and if SBA determines there is a duplication, then folks can use their insurance policy proceeds to pay down their loan. But if folks took a grant from one of the HUD CDBG grantees, then it is going to be imperative for them to decide whether they want to go through this process, because they very likely already received funds for the exact same purpose we would give them money, and they will have a debt when that is over. Going back to uh, the handful of engineering uh, firms that seem to be at the root of the Sandy fraud cases, how does FEMA currently conduct oversight over third party contractors, and how, again, are these firms held accountable? The, the, just with recognizing the time, the, the oversight is conducted through uh, what are called operational reviews that are conducted for a week every three years. They are wholly inadequate, in my view. Uh, there are other uh, existing forms like uh, monitoring for improper payments, but again, I think we have lost. Uh, we have lost sight of the network, and these are not adequate mechanisms, but those are the ones that are in place. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlelady. Uh, time has expired with that. To go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kaiserman, thank you for your uh, candid responses. Uh, very much appreciated. Somebody joked earlier, you mentioned one of your uh, sons dropped out of college temporarily, and somebody said, you know, uh, if you asked him why, he's so straightforward, he'd probably tell you right here in the chair. That, that, that's a real compliment. We don't get a lot of that. We get a lot of uh, people that like to dodge answering any questions or giving straight yes or no. So hats off to you for that. Thank you. And good luck at the Red Cross. Um, what amount do you think was knowingly paid in losses uh, to non-Sandy related property? I don't have a number for that, Congressman. I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. I, I honestly don't have a number for that at all. I'm sorry, especially okay. after those nice compliments. I feel bad. It, 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 yeah. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know the answer. I shouldn't have said anything. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, are you aware that some was knowingly paid that were non-Sandy related? I was not aware of that, sir. Uh, like millions of dollars for new roofs on museums within a stone's throw of this building? Uh, so I, I don't know that those were flood insurance funds as opposed to funds from other agencies, but we can get back to you on that. Yeah. I, and I'm looking at the whole Sandy package. I mean, I, I know there was a lot of pork in there when I read it that wasn't related, and, and I know that the Rules Committee felt it was not in order uh, to require an amendment that said all Sandy-related losses have to be related to Sandy. I, I know that is good congressional sense, but it's not good common sense. Uh, and so my question to you is, uh, how do you think Congress uh, can better exercise uh, its ability to perform oversight in the future? I mean, Congress is real good at sitting back and, and patting uh, themselves in the back saying, we've got it under control until we have a catastrophic loss here, there, or elsewhere. And then, of course, it's the insurance industry's fault, it's the agency's fault, it's everybody's fault but Congress. Uh, what do you think Congress can be doing? actually to be more engaged to make sure uh, we don't have this kind of uh, dysfunction uh, when the time comes. Well, Congressman, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, we all tend to pay attention at the catastrophic, uh, but the reality is that on an average loss year for insurance or an average disaster year for the country, that's the time to be paying attention. That's the time to hold hearings. That's the time to ask questions. That's the time for the agency to be looking at its, its organization. That's the time for that to happen. Because when the catastrophic occurs, it's all hands on deck and we're just trying to deal with the moment. I think the key, as you pointed out, is having that level of attention when it's a non-catastrophic event. Exactly. Any, any, any suggestions of how we might engage that? Is, is, are there experts that we should bring in to, to, to do an audit? Do you think an inspector general is sufficient? 
You know, how, how do we look at doing a dry run and do they have that and who analyzes the results of those things? So I think GAO has done phenomenal work and I would continue to, I would urge you to continue their use. I've reached out to GAO and they have begun an audit uh, on our program to help us understand the forensics of where the money goes. I'm a big believer in follow the money and that will help you understand the organization. And I think GAO can be a great asset to this body. Uh, has, has there been, uh, certainly we've all heard of, of people who, who dropped a ball uh, who didn't do their job. Uh, unfortunately, some of them were federal employees. Um, what has been the level of discipline for those employees who did not uh, perform as they should have in this, in this situation? Well, as you know, the, uh, it, it, there are several senior employees who uh, have chosen to uh, resign or retire uh, as a result of this, and by doing that, um, I think they recognize their role and create space for others to come in and make change. Uh, there are some less senior employees uh, who I've asked the Inspector General to investigate so that we can have a, a, again, give everyone the process they're due, survivors, employees, contractors, everyone, so that we can understand. So I have asked the Inspector General to look at the performance of several employees uh, who I believe had information about this and should have alerted senior leadership earlier in the process. I am awaiting those investigations. I, I would hope that you'd also include those members who have resigned and moved on. We, you know, we had similar problems with Matt off at the SEC, and the secretary came in here and actually told me, well, uh, you know, we haven't disciplined anybody yet, but it, it might make you comfortable to know that X number of people resigned. So, well, it really doesn't make me comfortable. You know, they, they probably have similar high-paying positions in other agencies uh, that we're paying, and, and it's like, you know, saying, when a pedophile changes neighborhoods, the problem solved. And, and well, I agree, Congressman. Uh, accountability doesn't stop when you leave the agency. I doubt it will stop for me, and it shouldn't stop for others. Uh, I can tell you that, uh, in, that the state's attorneys general that are looking at this and the inspector general uh, are looking at anyone who is involved, regardless of their current employment status. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope we'll get a report and an update on that. Uh, even if he's gone, I would like to see the results of that for our committee. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, and his time's expired. With that, we go to the gentleman from uh, Texas, Mr. Green. Five Thank minutes. you again, Mr. Chairman, and, and the ranking member as well. Um, I have been in Congress for a number of years, and I must say that I agree with Mr. Posey. Uh, sir, your testimony has been brutally frank. I rarely hear the level of um, frankness and, uh, that I've heard with your testimony, so I'm grateful as well that you have been forthright now, I do have a couple of concerns. One, with all that you've said, I want to make it clear to all who are hearing your testimony that you do not contend that we should end FEMA. Uh, I think I'm hearing you say we should mend it but not end it. Is that a fair assessment? That's a very fair assessment, Congressman. I think you need a very strong national flood insurance program. The private market does not appear ready to step in. Uh, Americans and business, small businesses need access to flood insurance. Uh, 5.3 million Americans are doing it now and need it. I don't know where they get it if we're not here. And so I think we need to strengthen the national flood insurance program. Thank you. I had the opportunity this weekend in Houston, Texas, just passed, to talk about FEMA and the various programs on a radio station. And we had a caller, appeared to be a young lady. Her indication was that she had paid her flood insurance regularly, wasn't uh, behind it. There was no lapse in the program as, in terms of her payments. And she indicated that she was very much distraught, perhaps not in these words, because the program did not reward her as she thought it should when she had fulfilled all of her obligations. And I'm laying this as a predicate for this question. Is it true that the penalty for overpaying a victim is more severe than the penalty for underpaying? I'm trying to find some rational reason for the behavior that we are talking about today. Can you comment, please? Yes, Congressman. Uh, there, it is not the case that the penalty, if you will, for overpaying is more severe than the penalty for underpaying. Um, the penalty is for not paying the correct amount over or under. 
And so uh, that was not true four years ago, but it is true today and, and, and based on some changes that were done uh, after Katrina. As far as what the reason is behind the conduct of engineering firms that alter reports uh, or, or any of that, I don't have an answer for you. It's really difficult to understand the why. What I would offer to you is this. I think it's imperative that the system that we use to detect that kind of conduct, that system needs to be strengthened because whatever the why is, until we understand the scope of it, we're not going to be able to fix it. Well, I, I rarely try to get an explanation for irrational behavior, but usually when fraud is involved, uh, there is some reward, some place in the system. And I'm trying to find that, that gravamen, if you would, that reward that's in the system. And are you indicating that at this point you too have not been able to locate the reward that someone would receive? I have not. And I've brought forensics accountants in to help me. It's why I've asked GAO to come in. Uh, I've spoken with the Attorney General Office in New York in particular because I know they are looking at the same question. I do not have an answer for you because I do not understand why anybody would do some of the things that are alleged. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, with the remainder of my time, I'd just like to focus on Houston, Texas and recent events. We have had a catastrophe. We've had much property damage. Lives have been lost. And it's our job as members of Congress to do all that we can to assist our constituents. But I also want to indicate that in Houston, I saw something that was very heartwarming. I saw a, a symbiosis develop. The mayor's office was involved, and the mayor herself, the governor, immediately acted. The Red Cross, the agency that you are are going to move to, and by the way, I, I uh, salute you if this is what you want to do, uh, but was very much involved. We even had the Mormon church providing translators for persons who needed uh, some assistance. Uh, we had a Chinese community center housing people uh, who were victims of the, uh, the storm. So I want to just commend those in Houston who've done an outstanding job, but I also want those who are still suffering to know that we plan to do all that we can to be of assistance to them, especially people who are out of their homes now and have no place to go. Uh, some will, but many do not, and it's important that we do all that we can to help and that they not be defrauded at this time of need. Exceedingly important. Mr. Chairman, I thank you so much for the time, and I yield back. Gentlemen, time has expired. With that, we go to the gentleman from Virginia, uh, Mr. Hurt, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the chair for holding this important hearing. Um, Mr. Kaiserman, I'm Robert Hurd. I represent Virginia's 5th District in, in uh, Southern Virginia. And I guess what uh, I hate to see, uh, and I know we all agree on this, is uh, to see one more reason why the American people don't trust the Federal Government. And this is a perfect example of that. Uh, and the people that I represent weren't affected by Hurricane uh, Sandy. Uh, uh, directly, but certainly uh, the the same distrust and uh, uh, and and, and uh, you know terrible behavior uh, reflects uh, and and affects them in this in, in much in the same way. Um, I guess my question, just building on Mr. Green's line of questioning, though, it just seems impossible that you don't have some idea what it is that would motivate. Uh, uh, these uh, agencies of the government, the, the engineering firms or the adjusters, uh, to under undervalue uh, the damage. I mean, there's got to be some incentive uh, that is uh, can 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 be can, can be adjusted uh, to, uh, to to get to that. So uh, it's just hard for me to believe that you don't have any idea. Well, Congressman, uh, I have talked to plaintiff's attorneys, I have talked to judges, I have talked to insurance companies and adjusters and engineers who I believe are credible, trustworthy people, and they don't have any idea. Um, it, it is, it, well, what could it possibly be? Well, I think, I think there are separate pieces here. So where the adjusting piece is concerned, there is software that all adjusters use. And in the NFIP, there's multiple softwares that people are using. One of the things that I would change as a reform is I would go to a single software. I don't think you should have multiple types of software because they can result in different outcomes for different people. There should be consistency. So if there's errors in the software, errors in the algorithm, that can result but in fraud. But fraud, but fraud necessarily requires an intent. So if there is intent to right. defraud the policyholder, I guess my question is, is are having uh, software that is, is inconsistent, that's not intention, necessarily intentional. Right. Could be, I guess, but, but, but that doesn't make sense to me. No. 
All right. Well, what about on the on the uh, engineering side? There's these allegations that uh, reports were doctored. What's right. that about? So I think the best I can tell you is this. I do not understand why a, a, an individual at an engineering back office would take their report from a licensed professional engineer, alter it, not consult with that engineer, and then append that engineer's signature and seal. Lazy? Lazy's one exp So Congressman, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm you. back to follow the money. I, I, I have to believe that somewhere someone at some engineering company thought that they'd either get more business if they found causation by flood less percent of the time, maybe they thought they would get less business if they found otherwise, maybe there's a money connection here we're just not seeing. But, is but that, we haven't seen but, Okay, but is that an incentive that's imposed by the federal government or by, by, the, by the flood insurance program? I, I don't know and I, I don't think anyone else does either. This is one well, of the reasons why these attorney general investigations are critical. We simply do not have the facts. But who makes those decisions? I guess going back to Mr. Garrett's question, who makes the decisions about who about, about the engineering firms that are chosen and does uh, efficiency uh, or, or, or lower, you know, lowest claims, amount of claims uh, or, or uh, dollar amount of claims, is that an incentive for hiring these, these, these folks? So I, I don't have any reason to believe that's the case, but I do. So you ask me who makes the decision. So the write your own insurance companies and FEMA's direct side agent decide who to bring in for engineers. And, and most of the insurance companies, like FEMA, uh, contract their work out to, to about nine vendors in the United States. So we talk about 82 write your owns. The reality of it is there's, there's about nine vendors in one or, two, one or two companies who are doing most of the work here. And so what incentives do they have to hire bad engineers or to, to hire engineers that are going to defraud people? Who, I don't who know. gets the money? Who gets the money? That's the question. Right. And I'm asking you that. Right. So the, 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 money, the money flows, and this is the point, the money flows back in layers. So the contracting firms, the vendors get money, the, the write your owns get money, the engineering okay. firms get money. And so this is the why we need to follow the money, because here's where we should be. We should be, we should be making sure that every person who's paid a premium and is insured and has a loss caused by the flood, that they get their money. That's where we should be focused right now. And that's where I think we need to make sure that the program is focused to make sure that every person who has a loss gets every dollar to which they were entitled. Amen. Uh, real quick, we only have 10 seconds, but um, the fact that you've opened up the 140. 2,000 other cases. Um, have, does anybody have any idea what that process in and of itself uh, will cost, and are there concerns about that Addi in additional costs? So the, the total cost of the claims review uh, right now I estimated about $40 million, and that's all the costs associated with running it, standing up, and doing all the work and adjudicating claims. But Congressman, to your earlier point about public trust and integrity, the cost of losing that trust is far greater than $40 million. Yeah, but we shouldn't be here in the first place. That's right. All right. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. With that, we go to the gentleman from uh, Massachusetts, Mr. Crapiano, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kieserman. Um, I think you're 100 percent right, obviously, to follow the money. This is a money thing. Where it is, I don't know any more than you know. But it, I'm just wondering, do engineers, whoever, do they get paid by the number of parcels they review? In some cases, yes, Congressman, that's the model. So that the more they do, the more they get paid, and the more you do, the quicker you are, the less detailed you are. And when you bring that back to the home office to say, here are my 100 reports for this hour's worth of time, if you say no, no one's going to tell you to go back out and check it, because there's no payment to be made. If you say yes, they may say, you know, hey, Fred, I'm not so sure. Maybe you need to go check that one again. Therefore, you don't get paid for it. Now, I'm not saying that's the deal, but I mean, there's clearly money involved. You're 100 percent right to chase it. And, and Congressman, I think you've got a great point there. And, and all I would add is that just a few weeks ago in open court, there was evidence adduced that the billing process, uh, even though uh, it was a parcel by parcel uh, uh, structure, they billed a flat rate. And that was adduced in open court. So uh, that's being investigated as potential fraud as well. Well, I, I, we all look forward to the results of all that. Thank you. Um, I, I want to talk to you about some of the bigger issues. I mean, there are some of us who have continued to look at the flood insurance situation, not individually Sandy, but obviously lessons learned from Sandy, but also how we keep this thing alive, how we improve it, how we make it work. Um, I just have a question for you. If, if I had a home on the Jersey Shore and I ran away because I was told to leave, and I came back and my house was going, do you think I'd really care if it was swept away by the ocean tides or the wind or shifting sands or little mice? My house is gone. Do you, do you think it should matter? 
I, Brad Kaiserman, I don't think it should matter, Congressman, but I will tell you this, as somebody managing a federal program, the actuarial difference between what it costs to limit causation to flood versus what it costs to deal with other issues is significantly different, and we're going to have to figure out how to manage that and how to educate I the public about what they're buying. The flood insurance program was, as, as you say in your testimony, was created for classic floods, rain and only rain, like is going on in Texas right now. It wasn't necessarily created for hurricanes where there is wind and rain simultaneously, and it wasn't created sometimes for tornadoes. It wasn't, I would argue that one of the things we need to look at is natural disaster insurance as opposed to simply flood insurance, Absolutely. therefore getting rid of all the nonsense about was it rain, was it not. And I've heard this, we heard it in Katrina, we're hearing it again in Sandy, and to be perfectly honest, I think it's a, I, I understand the technicalities of why it has to be done, but from, our, from my perspective, I think it's stupid for us to require it. A disaster is a disaster, and whatever specific item caused your specific loss, in my opinion, shouldn't matter. I, I guess I have another question. During your, your um, work, is there a difference if I don't live on the shore of New Jersey, but you know what? I have a small little restaurant. I open it up six, seven, eight months a year, try to make as much as I can to feed my family and send my kids to college. Hurricane comes along, my business is blown away. Should that be treated differently than a homeowner? I, I acknowledge that there's a lot of public policy issues there, but if you're asking my opinion, my opinion is that if you're a small business and you have a loss, um, you should be able to get your loss adjusted and make sure that you get the money you need. You're the economic engine of the, of the community. Why would we do anything other than treat them the same? I, I would agree with you, yet you, I, I know you know that when we so-called fixed our problem with flood insurance, we didn't fix it for small businesses. So we are now, we are now looking at the number of small businesses that we have. Uh, there's a study going on right now to identify how many small businesses are actually in the program, and that will help us understand better how we can better adjust their claims. And when, when Sandy hit, did it, well, you tell me, I'm not, again, I'm not terribly familiar with the, the Jersey Shore, but is everybody who owns a house on the Jersey Shore, are they all wealthy? Are Donald Trump the only one who owns a house? Along the Jersey Shore, there's some working class people that have struggled hard to get maybe a small, tiny little piece of the pie. I met a lot of working class people, blue collar folks, and people who've worked for a long time to get their homes who were impacted by that. And, and some yeah. of those might be second homes. They actually might live in, you know, downtown Newark and have struggled to get a small little piece on the Jersey Shore so their family can get out of the city on occasion. That's right. Uh, yet we didn't treat them well either. They're not covered by the fix that we had either. Is that right? Right. If you're, uh, the primary residents are the main focus of the National Flood Insurance Program. Secondary homes are treated differently. I take your point about why people have second homes, uh, but the public policy decision of the well, I know. That's what, yes, that, that's, I, I'm struggling with the public policy, and I'm not struggling with it. I actually think this is easy. I mean, you know, you know second homes, I mean, if Donald Trump has a second home, it's too bad if he loses it, but I'm not going to cry a lot. But that's not most people who own a second home, and I'm sure that in your work on the Jersey Shore, you've seen that, and I know you've seen it. I know you saw it in Katrina. I know you see it every time there's a disaster in areas where there are some second homes. And I guess my time is over, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Kisman. Gentlemen's time has expired. With that, we go to the uh, gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, Mr. Director, th uh, thank you for being here. I come from a state that's surrounded three sides by water, and we are used to a little bit of flooding and we're used to some windstorms. We're also uh, a, a, a donor state to the National Flood Insurance Program. We probably um, contribute more in terms of premiums than we ever get back in terms of claims. And my concern is, is that we have created this model that we use the word insurance when in fact what we've created is a relief model, relief being a post-event uh, distribution of, um, of, of dollars in order to uh, try to, to uh, correct and, and, and um, resolve the damage, as opposed to insurance, which is a pre-event, actuarially assessed, capital-based program. And so now in the NFIP, as we have seen happen in, in, in Sandy and in what we have seen happen in, in, in other areas throughout the country, is that we really have a relief program. And actuarially, I am concerned that we are not, that we're not assessing the value of the risk, because the risk is what the risk is. I mean, and you understand this. I mean, if you choose to live uh, next to an ammunition factory, you don't want to light a match. That's the risk of living there. If you choose to live in an area that is under uh, a floodplain, uh, there is a risk there. 
And so what we've got to do is that we've got to somehow balance a market to make sure that we have a capital that will come in and bear that risk at the price that's appropriate. But also we've got to do, from a policymaking point of view, what's necessary to do what we refer to as mitigation. Because if it's going to be a true insurance program, then we've got to realize that the pre-event investment is going to save us on the post-event uh, contribution. In other words, studies have shown that for every $1 in mitigation, you receive a $3 benefit in value when it comes to relief. My question to you is, is, what is going on in terms of mitigation? Anything that you specifically recommend that homeowners can do in terms of trying to mitigate against potential flood problems, whether it be structural uh, improvements, whether it be you know, um, um, uh, waterproofing a basement, things of that nature. We, first of all, that risk, if it is borne by the individual homeowner and they are aware of that risk, they are aware of the value of that risk, they have a tendency to want to make sure that they themselves manage that risk and protect that risk. Mitigation is the area. I would love your comments on that. So I think it is uh, critically important, uh, whether it is homeowners or small businesses or public infrastructure, that everyone prioritize mitigation, as you said, pre-storm and pre-event, because that is the way you truly buy down risk. You can either reduce risk, you can avoid risk, or you can ignore it. We right. shouldn't be ignoring it. I agree. So, so in order to mitigate, if I am a homeowner, I can drive flood proof, I can elevate, um, I, can, uh, I can look at structures to reduce flood flow into my home. Uh, those are all measures you can take. And frankly, and again, not an option for everyone, but some people can choose to relocate, especially if they are in a floodplain, and those are decisions people have to make. Has it been your experience when people are incentivized financially to make mitigation improvements that they will do so? Sometimes, but there is more than just rational actors involved in this. There is emotion involved. This is the Congressman said earlier from New Jersey. Sometimes people work their whole life, and that is their parcel, and they are not going to leave it. And so I, I think it is both. Well, I agree, but if given that, 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 that emotional feeling, you would want to have to protect it, and part of that protection is knowing that, that you have been incentivized to mitigate against it. For example, whether I have a tax-free savings account that I can use solely to put in that waterproof basement or to put up those berms to keep right. them. Those would be good options, would they not? I think they would be good options that are worth considering, along with the fact that uh, to the extent that we can help people make good mitigation decisions, that we can help educate people about how they can mitigate their risk and buy it down and how that protects their investment, that is a, that's a role all of us can play, including uh, banking industry and others. I, the housing industry, the banking industry, yes. everybody. I think think that this isn't just solely a government responsibility or task. Let me ask you also, when we did the fix last year to the Bigger Waters uh, bill, we, we put a provision there, I believe, that would allow for the disclosure or publishing of uh, the uh, science or the actuarial analysis that is being done. Has any of that been disclosed or has any of it even been requested by anybody on the outside? Uh, I don't know if the disclosure, disclosures have been done. We'll do the get back for you on that. There are a number of studies going on on the the actuarial soundness of the NFIP. But the reality of it is, this is a this is a subsidized product, and I, I agree with everything you said prior about this being a hybrid between disaster assistance as a relief program and an insurance program. It is not pure insurance. It is right. not actuarially sound. And frankly, I don't think it will be. If it were actually sound, the private industry would sell it. And we should get the privacy in industry in there, and if we can let them assess that risk, there's an opportunity for that capital to be there. Yep, I, I agree. There, there is a potential here, especially as we look at reform, at a layered approach. It doesn't just have to be the National Flood Insurance Program. I think there's opportunities out there for reinsurance and other layers so that people can buy down their risk with private product and that this product is not the, is really the, the last line of defense, not exactly. the Exactly. The market of last resort. My time is up. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. I think the gentleman time has expired. Interesting line of question. I enjoyed that. Uh, very good, Mr. Ross. Uh, with that, we go to the uh, gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Beatty, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and to uh, our ranking member. Uh, let me say to the witness, uh, thank you. Usually around here it is bad news that travels fast about a witness. Uh, but I got a call saying we have a good witness. And both sides are saying that. So I expect you to carry that off to your next duty uh, when you leave. But we have heard uh, a lot about the situation here, and we have also heard a lot about uh, FEMA. So my question is, FEMA has asked the Inspector General to make recommendations to them to improve its oversight role. Can you shed any light or share with us, are there any efforts to improve that role currently that is underway, or will FEMA take any actions on its own in the interim? Congressman, we have established a task force at FEMA that uh, I have had the, the honor to lead uh, for the last uh, 100 and or so days. Mr. Wright will be taking over the uh, overall operation here in a few weeks. 
one of the three things the task force is doing is working near-term reform. We are not going to wait for others. We are going to move forward. We would like to move with our partners, but we know that there's a sense of urgency here and that we have to maintain that. One of the challenges that we have is that we have 75 federal employees trying to oversee an enterprise of what really amounts to 6 million people when you take into account the 5.3 million policyholders. So some of the things we can do, uh, and I would just raise for Congressman Green from Texas, uh, I do intend to establish before I leave this job a hotline uh, so that uh, your constituents and others that may be affected by floods this season um, can call into us until we have a more robust network that allows us to detect and monitor uh, these potentially systemic problems. I want to make sure people have a place to go before they have to appeal their claim to their insurance company, before they have to sue. We will have that established before I leave office here in the next week and a half. So that will be the first thing that we do. We are going to work with our Write Your Own companies and others to see how we can better structure our oversight. We have withdrawn their authority to pay for engineering services without our pre-approval. That will help us do a better job at screening the engineering companies. Uh, we are going to immediately increase our policyholder education so that people understand what they have bought. That is one of the things I have seen, Congresswoman, is that people are very surprised at time of loss because they don't really know what they bought. We need to work that piece. Adjuster training. You know, the adjusters that we have brought in for the claims review process have received very special training. We are going to expand that to all adjusters over the course of the next year or so uh, so that, that all the adjusters can get uh, the sort of training that we have that makes them more sensitive to the needs of survivors. That is just a few of the things that we will be doing. The reform team has come up with well over 50 ideas that I am sure Mr. Wright and I will be talking about over dinner on Sunday night. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. If uh, Mr. Cleaver would need some of my time, I would be willing to give him those minutes. We recognize the gentleman from Missouri. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beatty. Uh, uh, my my uh, concern is, is well, a, lot of, a lot of them, but is the, the fact that uh, FEMA is apparently going to open up 144,000 claims uh, and that it's very close to, if not the same, as the number of claims originally filed, although only 2,800 uh, were appealed. Uh, 2,800 of, of those claims were, uh, that were filed were appealed. Uh, what precedent uh, will you be setting for the storms of the, of the future? It, and is this a, a corrective step? Congressman, this is a corrective step. It recognizes that there were deficiencies in the delivery of the program. So I think two things that have to happen. One, you have got to provide redress for that now. And two, you have to correct the system going forward so that this doesn't happen again and you don't have to provide that type of redress. And just to clarify, we are providing everyone who was impacted by the storm and filed a, and filed a claim with the opportunity to have their claim reviewed. It is their choice to opt in. Some people have got what they needed. Some people are fatigued by this and are just done with government, and that is fine. Some people got money from SBA or got money from HUD and their needs were met. This is really for people who believe they were underpaid and didn't have a form of redress. If you are litigating, you are not eligible for the process. If you had an appeal and it was closed, unless we can find wrongdoing, you won't be eligible for the process. Uh, quickly, my time is just about out. You know, we had a, we had a problem with Wall Street. They, they, they uh, intentionally, as the, the word was mentioned, committed fraud. Uh, Nobody has gone to, to jail. Nobody has even gone on trial for almost sending this nation uh, into uh, another depression. Uh, do you have any feeling about what would happen if we uh, can prove uh, without a doubt that insurance companies were committing fraud? Uh, will someone be prosecuted? Will there be prosecutions, like if that's Rob 7-Eleven? I, I have no doubt that there will be prosecutions if there is evidence of that, but I would tell you, Congressman, that I, I think what you are going to see is evidence of subordinate entities doing that activity, not insurance companies. Uh, we will see. Time has expired. With that, we go to uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Rothfuss, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to pick up on that little bit of a line, line of questioning and also following up on what Mr. Hurt was saying, because I'm still trying to get my arms around incentives that might be out there. And, and maybe if we could talk a little bit about the transaction that happens for, for the, the, the homeowner. Um, who is who the inter, who, who is the homeowner going to interact with uh, in in the process? So, Congressman, in the review process, or well, when the claim gets filed. Right. So, when a, when a, the first thing a homeowner does is that they call their agent and they say, "I've had a loss." 
And then what happens next is the, the agent works with the homeowner and the insurance company to send an adjuster out. So that adjuster, that adjuster is the center of gravity for all of this. That's first contact, meaningful contact with, a, with an insurer. And the adjuster then sends out the engineer? The adjuster will call for an engineer if there is an issue with respect to causation of structural damage. Adjusters are not trained generally to assess structural damage. And so if they see that, they'll bring an engineer in to say, hey, did the flood cause the damage? It's a causation. So the engineer comes out, does a study, then somebody back at the office somehow changes that study or the evaluation. Well, certainly those are the allegations that of what, what occurred in Sandy, and I have seen evidence that that happened in multiple occasions. Should that happen? What I'm told by professional engineering firms is that the notion of peer review doesn't involve the change in real time of reports. It involves a later look for QA for quality assurance and quality control. It's not what's been alleged to have happened in Sandy. These so, engineers are licensed in a particular state? So that's a great question. Uh, in Sandy, some of the engineers who performed functions were not licensed in the state where they were working. Some of the engineers that reviewed in the back office were not licensed in the state where the residence was located. And some engineers weren't licensed at all. In fact, some of the people doing this were biology majors. Well, are the processes that were followed in Sandy typical, typical for how uh, other claims would come in for NFIP? I, I don't know the answer to that, sir, because if we knew the answer, we'd have prevented this up till now, which is why we're putting some of these measures in place in Texas and other, elsewhere so this doesn't happen again. Has FEMA's Inspector General been engaged to review this matter at all? Yes. So, What's the scope of that review? So I think I have to ask the Inspector General, given their independence, but within the first week of taking the job, I put a full referral package together. And I'll just add that I met with plaintiff's attorneys, uh, the lead plaintiff's counsel in this case. He was very generous in giving us information about his cases that we shared with the Inspector General uh, and with the state's attorney in New York and New Jersey so that they could have, th they don't have to spend time uh, uh, reinventing the wheel on the investigation. In, in the claims process, what interaction is there between a, a WIO, an engineer, an adjuster, and any individual at FEMA? Uh, minimal. And it varies uh, from, from write your own to write your own. Some of them use uh, different models in terms of the services they buy from vendors. In some cases, they get complete service from a vendor and they have minimal interaction. FEMA's first interaction in most cases with an insured is in the appeals process when the insurance company has denied a claim and an insured comes to us. And as I said in Sandy, do, that Do you know whether the Inspector the General is going to be uh, or is asking or has asked for, for information from FEMA employees who, who may have any information uh, uh, about what happened prior to an appeal? I, I do not know the answer to that. Uh, um, in your testimony, you stated that NFIP has no consistent or reliable method to identify systemic problems, preemptive preemptively identify and address claims or appeals with similar adjustment issues, or recognize patterns from warning signs like policyholder complaints, congressional correspondence, appeals, and other data. What is being done about that? Several things. So to begin with, um, we are putting significant resources on uh, bringing in the information technology that we would need. Uh, I'm sure within the next year we will be setting a standard for data collection, uh, at least next year or two years for standard for data collection. Uh, so that insurance companies and others give us a standard that we can work for through. Uh, we will set up uh, this hotline so that we have the ability now to connect the dots and sort of clear the signal to noise ratio, which has been a problem. But I think the real focus here is going to have to be the development of a customer service unit that focuses on the customer. And whether that's a combination of secret shopper or, or customer interviews, we cannot rely on adjusters and WIOs or anyone else to be assessing the services the customer you are getting. We have an obligation to assess the customer service. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Um, with that, we go to the ranking member of the entire committee, Ms. Waters from California. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I am sorry that I was not able to be here at the same time that Chairman Henselman was here, because first of all, I would like to express my a uh, deep concern about what is going on in Texas and inquire about uh, what is being done uh, to make sure that um, the citizens are being taken care of and that um, bodies are being located um, that uh, may not have yet been uh, identified as lost. Uh, but I would like to ask um, Mr. Kiesemann here today. Have you had an opportunity to talk with our chairman to explain to him what you know about what has happened in, in Texas and how severe that is? No, Congressman, I have not had that opportunity. Uh, uh, perhaps he has not had uh, the time uh, to make that call to you, uh, but I would, um, 
ask you if you would offer yourself uh, to the chairman to explain to him exactly how devastating uh, the storms have been in Texas and what it's going to take uh, to compensate um, those who have been displaced, whose homes have been destroyed, on and on and on. I think it's very important. Uh, you may know that uh, during the time that we were involved with the reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program, perhaps the uh, chairman uh, did not feel uh, that we needed to reauthorize that program. And I'm not asking you to convince him of anything. I'm just asking you to share with him uh, exactly what has taken place um, in Texas. This may cause him to rethink uh, what he feels about the National Insurance Program. So I appreciate that. Uh, now, having said that, <clears throat> the NFIP is uh, in, in the red with a staggering debt of $24 billion. Most people assume that it is because of subsidies written into the program. But historically, the program had been self-sufficient. I, hold, um, I um, believe we should be taking a close look at the administrative cost of the program. Uh, and I would like to ask, to what extent has FEMA revised this WYO compensation practices to address concerns identified in prior GAO reports? For example, a 2009 GAO report found that FEMA consistently overpays why uh, WYOs for operating expenses. The WYOs currently receive 30 percent of premiums just for operating expenses, yet they hold none of the risk. So what, if any, is your timeline for better aligning the costs and expenses of the WYO program? So, Congresswoman, uh, we have just literally just met in the last week or so with GAO, uh, who now opening a very specific engagement on uh, WIO compensation, and we gave them a substantial amount of input about our concerns, uh, some of which we share with you, uh, about the compensation framework. I would offer just two points, if I might. Uh, first, um, I, I respectfully disagree that WIOs don't share in the risk. While it is true that they don't financially share in terms of the pool of money from which claims are paid, I think if you asked any of the 25 or 27 or so companies that are in litigation in New York and New Jersey today, they would tell you they share considerably with respect to reputational harm. And frankly, I want them to share in that risk with FEMA and with government. That's what we need in our partners, uh, regardless of whether they're contractors or federal entities. And many of those write your own Congresswoman, have in fact stepped up now that the evidence is becoming clearer. Some still need some additional persuasion. Uh, the other point that I would make with you is that 30 percent, while it sounds like a large number, uh, when you look at the industry-wide standard for overhead, it's not that far out. I believe we can get that number down and get service up, but I do want to put that in context. So I think our goal needs to be working with GAO uh, and working with the Write Your Owns to cut layers out of this that we don't need 32 years into the program. Um, we may end up have reducing the number of WIOs or changing the structure of that, but there are ways for us to reduce costs while still increasing services, and I want to work with GAO and our partners to do that. No, Mr. Wright is committed to that as well. Well, thank you very much. And this is not in my notes for today, but it's been in my head for a long time uh, because I'm so concerned about the premium costs of this insurance to our constituents. I'd love to forgive the whole $24 billion, wipe it out. I know that's an unrealistic wish, perhaps, but what do you think about a bold idea like that? So uh, I, uh, without getting myself in too much trouble 10 days before <laughs> I leave Federal Service, uh, uh, what I would say is this. Um, this is not an actuarially sound program, and it was never designed to be. If the program could be delivered in an actuarially sound way, private industry would have taken care of it, and we wouldn't be involved. Um, the notion that there's $23 billion in debt, as you said when you began, the Write Your Own program and the NFIP generally have run solvent, uh, with the exception of nine years out of about 34. And one of those is Katrina, and I will just leave with this comment. The NFIP was as much a victim of a Katrina as everyone else who was a victim of Katrina. It literally blew us out of the water. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank I you. yield back the balance of money. Gentlemen, expired. Time has expired. With that, go to the uh, uh, recognized gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Kaiserman, uh, for your testimony today. As you can imagine, uh, uh, I, well, first of all, I'm from Texas, and uh, Wimberley, Texas, is in my district, and you're very familiar with that. So, as you can imagine. Uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are feeling for our, our fellow Texans uh, as they are experiencing historic flooding, uh, and this hearing to me is very timely. 
Uh, as you said in your testimony today, millions of Americans are physically and financially vulnerable to floods. A week's worth of flooding in my district, quite frankly, has brought that statement very close to home. As you probably know, the President just recently approved Governor Abbott's request for a major disaster declaration just last week, approved it very quickly. Uh, the residents in Hayes County, Texas, my, in my 25th district, which I represent, are beginning that process. Now, it goes without saying, I have a vested interest to make sure we get it right and that we fix the problems we discussed this afternoon. I will tell you, shortly after uh, this, I called your FEMA office and uh, talked to the regional director. Uh, he was very on top of the job. He got with us. They were on the ground, and I appreciated that very much, and I have made that public. Uh, so I guess I would say my first question to you is, you mentioned, of course, we have 142,000 uh, claims that you are uh, that you're reopening. Now, and that's $40 million, you said, approximately. Is that right? Uh, that will be the cost to do the work. That is not necessarily the outflows okay. of uh, payment policy. So what, now, what does that do to your budget? Uh, th there is no impact, uh, Congressman, on uh, our borrowing authority or on our cash on hand. We have sufficient funds uh, in the, available on hand uh, without having to borrow additional funds. But Sandy did strain your resources. Sandy did constrain our resources, yes. All right. So back home when I go to Texas, when I go back home to Texas, uh, uh, you're going to have plenty of room to help my Texans get done what need to be done, right? We have, we have uh, sufficient funding available right now to deal with the disasters in Texas and Oklahoma and elsewhere. And I would also just point out that we did extend the period to file proof of loss by an additional six months to give people space and time to do that. We know it is going to take them time to get back into their homes and it is going to take time to find all the damage. So they will have now up to 240 days uh, in order to file their proof of loss. And that should help. All right. Next question is, uh, uh, You've talked about reforms and the reforms you're doing now to make things uh, better, uh, and you talked in pretty good depth about that. Uh, am I, is it safe to say that all the reforms you talked about that you're making, that you're talking about making today, uh, will my constituents in Texas begin to see it tomorrow? I think that your constituents in Texas can count on the fact that we are hyper-attentive to what is happening in Texas and Oklahoma and flooding this year because of what we have seen happen in Sandy, uh, that Mr. Wright and I uh, and the leaders in our team are hyper-attentive to this. That is why we are going to establish a hotline. That is why we have extended the proof of loss. And that is why we are going to be watching very closely on the ground from Washington and working with our Write Your Owns to reduce any sort of risk that this could happen again. So we have learned from the past. So uh, we can be reassured that what we are talking about today won't happen again in Texas and Oklahoma. We are going to take every step we can, Congressman, to prevent that from happening. Now, you guys, we have already had 5,000 claims, 5,000 claims in a short period of time, and you know there is going to be a lot more. Uh, so we really want to get it right. And so I, I guess, you know, I come from a retail background, uh, and I, I think it is important that you, and I told your, your, your guys this when we talked last week, but please understand, these people are customers. They are customers, and they need to be treated as such. And they deserve uh, good. They deserve on-time service with very few hassles. And I hope all of your folks will understand that. Uh, you know, think retail and 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 give them the opportunity to to realize the benefits that, the, that that they have coming to them and begin to get their lives back. Texans are resilient people, and uh, they just kind of need to kind of know the rules. But I hope we've remembered from what's happened, so we can't we won't uh, we won't see this happen again. Uh, but I do thank you for your service and. Uh, uh, we will look forward to working with your agency as we move forward uh, uh, to fix, uh, fix our needs back home in Texas. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. With that, we recognize the uh, gentleman from uh, Kentucky, Mr. Barr, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Kaiserman. Thank you for your testimony here today, and, and, and thank you for your forthrightness in acknowledging that there is a problem with the National Flood Insurance Program. I, too, saw the 60 Minutes uh, spot uh, with your interview and, and with the, uh, the, the real sad and tragic story of the victims of, of the mismanagement um, uh, with the program. Um, and, and obviously, uh, as, as the stories that were told in that 60-minute spot and some of the testimony that you are offering here today demonstrate that, that the program indeed uh, does need reform, that there is uh, governance issues and that there is a, a lost uh, capacity to monitor um, some of these insurance carriers and, and the engineering firms that, that made some egregious, egregious errors. Um, 
in, um, in that interview that you had with 60 Minutes, one of, the, one of the points that you made was that you had seen evidence of fraudulent reports and criminal activity by unlicensed engineers August of 2013. I know you came in after that, but you saw that as soon as you came into your position of authority with the agency, and that that was why you referred uh, the, the matter to the Inspector General. Uh, my question to you is, is, when do you assess that evidence was available to your predecessors at FEMA uh, that there was a problem? You indicated that there were signals August or to late 2013. When were your predecessors made aware of the signals or even worse, the, 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 the actual evidence of, uh, of, of uh, misconduct by partnering insurance companies and engineering firms? Congressman, I think members of the staff uh, had information in their possession by October, November of 2013, so one year after Sandy struck, that would have led a reasonable person to conclude that there was at a minimum irregular activity going on that warranted investigation. We did not act on that. Act I don't know that my predecessors were ever briefed on that. In fact, I don't think they were. It is one of the reasons that I think I need to reform that particular part of the program, because it is often the first time we touch the customer, that we have customer contact, and we have got to get it right. And we didn't. Okay. Right. And the Inspector General, have there been findings issued yet? Uh, the Inspector General received a referral from FEMA uh, after a Senate hearing in July of 2014. Um, the criminal side declined to investigate. The uh, programmatic audit side opened up an audit investigation. Um, in defense of anyone uh, who declined to investigate, I have to tell you, I don't think that all the pieces were clear. I think there was a high level of noise to the signal. There were lots of other things going on in the system until plaintiff's attorneys um, really began to marshal the facts and do their jobs in court in New York and New Jersey. And frankly, um, when the plaintiff's attorneys did that, it, it, and, and it became very evident what was happening. And so we ended up relying on the courts and plaintiff's attorneys and judges. What is the current liability of the NFIP? Is it $23 billion? $23 billion uh, currently in actuarial so debt. So there is enormous pressure on this, as you concede, an actuarially unsound and designed to be actuarially right. unsound right. flood insurance program. But there is enormous pressure to, to, to deal with that liability at the agency. So my question to you is, is there any, is there any evidence, to your knowledge, that, that, that FEMA is responsible for pressuring the engineering firms or the uh, insurance companies to, to cram down these claims? I haven't seen a shred of evidence of that, Congressman. Not a shred. Okay. Um, you know, Part of the problem, and by the way, my, the seventh vote that I cast as a member of Congress in, in, in January of 2013 was whether or not we were going to raise the borrowing limit for the National Flood Insurance Program in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy. And one of the problems that many of us had with simply raising the borrowing limit without reforms was that you create this pressure at the agency to not pay claims that people are entitled to. And we need to reform the, the, perhaps we need to reform the program so that there is a little bit of better pricing involved so that you don't have this pressure at the, uh, at, at the agency um, to, to, to deal with, with that issue. So my question to you is, why would you not entertain reforming the program so that it would be, so that, so that there would be better pricing of the risk? So I think it is a balance between properly pricing the risk and making sure that it is affordable, because if people can't buy it and can't get policies, then we have no revenue to pay claims. So it is a little bit of a catch-22. Um, I, I think in the end it really does come down to fully understanding the risk, which is the importance of mapping and the other programs that do risk identification, and then figuring out how do you get to a price that people can afford that properly balances the risk. This goes to the layers that private insurance well, can provide. My time has expired, but if you are not properly pricing the risk, you are subsidizing risky building. So I would say that if you are not properly pricing the risk, um, you are in, in one case dealing with people being able to afford it, but then you have to look at the balance of whether you are subsidizing other risk. I agree with you. There's a, it, it's, a, it's a public policy balance issue. Uh, my time has expired. Yield back. Time has expired. Uh, with that, we uh, recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Stivers, for five minutes. Thank you very much. I, uh, I certainly appreciate you being here, Mr. Kaiserman, and I know you are uh, your days are kind of numbered at this point, so 
Um, and I appreciate your forthrightness, and especially with regard to the third point in your policy about reforms, I appreciated your uh, forthrightness there. And in answering Mr. Ross's questions from Florida about um, the um, status of the program, and you know, clearly it is not actuarially sound. There is uh, clear adverse selection in flood insurance because the only people who buy flood insurance are people who are guaranteed to file a claim at some point. Instead of spreading risk around, we, you know, spread the plate around and, and there's never enough money and, and the taxpayers end up subsidizing. And, and that's always going to be somewhat the nature of the program. I understand that. But I, I want to focus on your reform efforts because I think there's a way to uh, be more efficient, uh, to actually manage the risk better. Um, and, you know, I know you've been working on it a while. And I'm curious if Mr. Wright has been engaged in these efforts, because, frankly, some of the things you talked about, about reinsurance um, and, you know, making sure that the flood insurance program um, has some private, mech, private sector engagement on pricing that I think will help everybody understand what the true risk is um, and help as you're do that delicate balance of pricing to ensure accessibility while also making sure that we, um, uh, we charge as appropriate an amount, as close to the appropriate amount as we can. So I guess my question is, has Mr. Wright been involved? So, Congressman, Mr. Wright uh, has been involved, and I have to say that uh, in addition to being my colleague and my friend, he has one of the highest degrees of business acumen in a government executive that I have ever encountered. Uh, he has been the Deputy Associate Administrator for Mitigation now for several years, and he's been involved in the National Flood Insurance Program uh, in all of its aspects for several years. Um, he also has at his disposal now a nearly 100-person task force, about a quarter of which is focused on reform, and that's all they come to work to do every day day is to analyze this program and develop reform. Mr. Wright is probably the most capable person uh, to drive this forward. He is far more capable in that area than I am. All I do is fix things that are broken. I'm not very good well, on the long term. Well, this thing still needs, is broken and needs fixed. So and, and he'll do that. Too. I wish you were still around a little bit longer. But um, the other concern I've got is if we don't step up our premiums quickly enough, uh, it does not give incentives for the state and local governments to change their building standards and their uh, and where they build, because, you know, if we uh, heavily subsidize through taxpayer subsidies, uh, coastal properties or risky properties, I should say, because they're not all coastal, that shouldn't, where we shouldn't be building, um, then we don't fix the real problem. The real problem is we have some things built in high-risk areas that, frankly, shouldn't be built. And I'll, I'll single out one state and one area, Ward 9 in New Orleans probably should not have been rebuilt. So, Congressman, uh, Mr. Wright has been instrumental in leading the effort to develop a, a federal risk management standard for flooding, uh, which has been implemented through executive order. It will affect federal investment as opposed to state and local only investment. Uh, but that is leadership by example, and it is a way to ensure that we are putting money in ways that mitigate risk and don't have us repeating this over and over again. Which is helpful, and it is the start of what it we is. need to do. But, but if we raise the premium to a, to a number closer to the actuarial standard, and what, what the real cost of the risk is, then it would discourage people from rebuilding in some areas where they shouldn't rebuild. And, and I'd like to encourage you, while I don't want to kick people out of their ancestral home, if their ancestral home is three feet below sea level and there's an ocean right there, that's a problem. I appreciate that conversation. So if we can work with, uh, with you on any of the legislative changes, Mr. Wright, that need made, Absolutely. and I know a lot of the things that you uh, need to do will require legislative language. It does not require legislative language to train your adjusters and agents better or to align your management of litigation better, which I think can help the process along. It also probably does not, uh, I don't think it requires legislation to require certification of, uh, of your engineering firms that are filing reports, some of whom might have done so fraudulently. So I think there's a lot of things you have latitude to do to fix your processes, but to the extent that you need any legislation, you know, my staff and I would love to help. I know there are other members who are taking leadership roles already, but I'm happy to help any way I can. And I just wanted to say that really for Mr. Wright's benefit. And, um, and I wanted to tell you, uh, Mr. Keisman, good luck at uh, American Red Cross. I'm sure you'll do a great job there. That's a very important organization and is a soldier 
uh, who gets to see some of their notifications and what they do with, with blood and other things. Um, I really appreciate what they do there as well as the natural disaster piece. So thank you for that. And my time is up. Thank you, Congressman. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. With that, we go to the uh, gentleman from uh, New Mexico, Mr. Pierce, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate uh, Mr. Kaiserman and your testimony, especially with this straightforward approach you take to explaining the problems that the agency faces. As I was listening to Mr. Ross describing that Florida is surrounded on three sides by water, I realized that New Mexico is, is uh, surrounded by water, too. It's just we have got about 2,000 miles of buffer on the east side and about 1,000 miles of buffer on the west side, Central America, Mexico, and Texas uh, to the south of us. But other than that, we're surrounded by water. The, uh, the, the problem that I've got is that as we found the problems of Katrina, then we began to raise the rates on people in New Mexico. And so we went first to, I think, from 250-year event to a 500-year and a 1,000-year event. Who makes the choice to do that? So the rate structure is established in part in legislation and then in part by the actuarial structure of the program. So uh, particularly after the legislation of the last several years, there's mandatory rate structure that we've got to follow. And, but who decides the flood event rather than? I'm sorry. I meant so who decides the flood event rather than increase premiums? So that's a that's a process of mapping, uh, and so the 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 way that we assess risk is by uh, creating flood maps, and FEMA is responsible for the creation of flood maps with the participation, the very active participation of communities, to help them understand their risk. Okay, so, but then the agency, the, is it the National Flood Insurance Program, that eventually decides that they're going to go with those flood maps or not? Uh, so yes, that's correct, and the community is so just be that. aware that I've got a constituent that lives 7,000 feet above mean sea level on a mountain, 3,000 feet above the little stream that's about as big as the pencil here running down, way down there, and he has to pay flood insurance because he's in the 1,000-year event level. So we're charging people that live on the top of the mountain in New Mexico where it didn't the last time it rained was during that NOAA event, and, and so we are charging them so that the people on the coast can rebuild houses that have been destroyed before at less than market value, and that's the problem when we begin to take, and the average, the average pay, uh, wage in our district is about 31000 so we're taking from people making 31000 a year in order to subsidize people with the oceanfront property, and that, that's a problem. I, in, uh, I don't think that it's going to change because I think your agency is frankly going to do the same thing regardless of if you're there or not. Uh, I was interested in your, your answers to, to uh, Mr. Williams. You said you're going to watch very closely to reduce the risk in Texas. Uh, does that mean you're going to audit the vendor? You're going to review the engineering reports? What? What are we going to do differently? We, we are going to put an audit regime into place uh, in near real time so that we, and of course, you, you need to understand, of course, the, the flow of events. Everything doesn't happen on day one. And so many people won't even file a claim for another three or four or five months. And that's one of the reasons why we've extended the period for proof of loss. So this program has a, uh, has a habit sometimes of, um, uh, I sometimes use the phrase, and it's probably inappropriate here, um, my staff's probably cringing, but it's a little bit of the, of the pig in the belly of the snake, right? And so it takes a while for these pieces to move through, and then suddenly it pops up later on, and it's all but forgotten in the media, but then we have problems. I want to get in there early now. I want to take a look at what's going on. I want to make sure we're monitoring the flow of claims, monitoring the process of engineering, uh, do secret shopper, uh, and check with people and see how, how that's working, and create this hotline. I think that combination of, of audit interventions will help us significantly reduce the risk of any improper conduct or wrongdoing, along with alerting our, our write your owns, which we've done through a bulletin, to what our expectations are with respect to adjustment of claims in engineering. You had mentioned an answer to a previous question that one of the problems in Sandy was, uh, and then you listed a series of problems with the engineers. One was that they weren't licensed in the state they were operating in. Uh, now, that may be a technicality, but have you figured out that those people who weren't registered were a source of the problem? Because what I typically see is bureaucracies find a reason 
and just something to say, okay, okay, we found the reason and let's go on. I suspect that if they're licensed engineers, if they weren't corrupt, that uh, their stuff may have been somewhat correct, may not have been perfect. Did you drill down on that at all? We have drilled down on that some, and I can tell you that at least in the case of one of the engineering firms that had a substantial part of the business, um, the individual who changed the report and then affixed the seal. Uh, that's signature. not a matter of, of being registered in another state. That's a matter of corruption. That's certainly a matter of not being licensed at all. I agree. Did you have you gone back into history? Any of these people who have problems submitted previous reports five, ten, fifteen years ago? Uh, are you are you checking that far back on the people with problems? Uh, we we are not checking that far back on people with problems, and I don't know whether the state's attorneys general are checking that far back on people with problems. One of the things we are doing is looking at people who had their claims adjusted with Irene or Lee just a year before Sandy to see whether adjusters or engineers came in at that point and identified pre-existing damage. If there was no pre-existing damage a year before, it's a little difficult to believe there was some new long-term pre-existing damage that was discovered. Yeah, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, people have to implement changes, and That's right. that I'm a little bit worried about. But I do appreciate your approach and appreciate your service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. With that, go to the, uh, we'll recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kaiserman. And I apologize, running around, it's been a busy day. But uh, I, you know, represent the 5th Congressional District in New York, which is basically uh, the Rockaways in Jamaica Bay, which was really devastated uh, by Hurricane Sandy. And so I want to make sure I got the procedures and everything down, because last month uh, uh, a number of individuals in my constituency began to receive mail uh, from the Postal Service informing them about the review process dealing with, uh, you know, some of the claims and of, of underpayment and fraud. So let, let me just first, I just want to make sure that I'm absolutely clear on what the process is. Uh, how I understand it, uh, the homeowners who feel that they were, they undersettled, they will get a 1-800 uh, number that they will call to request a review, and a caseworker, I think, will be assigned to them uh, to complete the file, and that will be done, that takes 30 to 45 days, and then it will be sent to an adjuster who would then contact the policyholder within the next seven to ten days, and I put this 55 to 60 days out when there should be some kind of correspondence there, I guess. And then a final decision uh, with payment will be made in the next seven to 21 days after the adjuster submits findings and determines the constituent is either eligible for an additional payment out, out of right. Is, is that correct? Congressman, that's mostly correct. Just a, a couple of uh, uh, adjustments, no pun intended, if you would. The caseworker who will be assigned will be an NFIP certified adjuster who has been specially trained uh, by our program. So the, the, the caseworker is, there, is, is the adjuster. There's not another layer in there. In terms of how long it will take to process claims, it really, cycle time will depend on input. So right now we're receiving about three to four hundred calls and emails a day. And it's not just the 1866 number people can call, it's on the web page. They can go also go online and they can register online and then we call them and collect the information and ensure they're eligible. Uh, no one should be in the process for more than 90 days. Uh, our target will be to have a significantly lower turnaround time, but it will depend on cycle time and complexity of the issue. But otherwise, I think you got that pretty much right, sir. And there's already um, resources, you know, because sometimes you get into these things set aside because it could be, you know, I, I, you know over 142,000 letters, what I'm understanding. Uh, and potential cases. So have resources already been set aside so that we can make those time frames and have the appropriate individuals that's going to do the inspections, uh, that those resources are all there? Yes, Congressman. So 95,000 letters have gone out as of today. We'll send about another 40,000 40, or so out uh, over the next two weeks. By June 11th, all the letters will be out. People don't need to wait for their letters. They can call now or they can email now if they had a Sandy claim. We have 600 human service specialists. These are people who answer the phone and do intake, fully trained and ready to do this. I've gotten some very positive feedback from, uh, from your colleagues about your constituents' uh, interactions with them, and I've gone back to them and, and told them I want them to keep up that up. We have 140 adjusters on staff, and yesterday uh, or today we are awarding a contract 
uh, for neutrals because one of the things you didn't mention is that if, if an insured is not satisfied with what their adjuster caseworker has developed, they can in fact get the services of a complete third party neutral that we will provide at our cost uh, to really do make a final decision on this one. I meant to make a good point. I meant to ask that yes, sir. question in regards to neutrals. So, but then, then let me follow up then more about the appeals process. Are there mechanisms in place to, or being developed to uh, identify genuine claims and mitigate prior to legislation? So, Absolutely. I don't know, is, there, is, that, is that occurring? What, one of our top priorities uh, and where we are working right now is to overhaul the appeals process. And I would say generally it's the entire NFIP dispute resolution process. It's not just appeals. It's how people are treated in the field with an adjuster. It's how people are treated when they call their insurance company. It's the entire dis dispute resolution network that's there. We're moving to overhaul that. The, the FEMA appeals network, though, will be appointing a new lead here in the next few weeks, and we will uh, be contracting to bring bring people in to help us do business process improvement with that now. So those individuals sit within the FEMA organizational structure? They do. Okay. And, um, and they are decided, well, let me, the, the, in the past, um, when the victims filed appeals in the past, what, could you tell me, do you have any idea what the success rates were? Fifteen percent, Congressman. 15%. If, you were, if you were a survivor, the average rate of appeal is about three to five percent of all claims filed or appealed. And of those, only 15 percent do we generally recommend to the right your owns that they come up with a different answer. Uh, that does not necessarily indicate to me that the process works well. It indicates to me that people may be fatigued by the process uh, and they may be worn down by the process. I don't think we have any internal or intrinsic view to know whether that means we have a well working process or not. What I saw in the aftermath of Sandy with whether appeals detected wrongdoing or not concerned me enough that I wanted to overhaul the program and the administrator has directed me to do so. Thank you very much. I'm out of time, but I want to thank you for your testimony and uh, wish you success. <clears throat> thank you, Congressman. Gentlemen's time has expired. With that, we would like to thank Mr. Keisman for being here today. Thank you for your testimony. You've been um, very frank, very forthcoming, and we certainly appreciate it. Uh, you've mentioned a couple times with regards to uh, reforms that you'd like to see. I know I asked the question about it. You've also talked about uh, a reform task force that you put together. Uh, if we can get you to give us uh, some information on the task force, Absolutely. Who, the parties that are involved, what you're trying to do with it, it would be fantastic. Understand that either yourself or some of your staff are going to sit down with uh, the committee staff shortly, the yes. next week or two here, and discuss some reforms. Uh, we certainly want to, to continue to look forward to that opportunity. Uh, and also, if you have got other ideas, uh, to be willing to put them into uh, a letter form or to inform uh, your staff when they meet with our, our committee staff to, to, to see once what your suggestions would be. You know, sometimes you need to be talking with the people who are at the eye of the storm to figure out what's going on and what we need to actually do to, to change things. But I uh, certainly appreciate all of that. I wish you well Thank in you, your Tom. occupation. I know Mr. Wright's got an awfully big set of uh, shoes to fill. I uh, wish him well. Look forward to working with him in the future. Uh, I know one of the issues that's concerned me that was brought up today was the mapping. Uh, I, like Mr. Pierce, have got homes that are sitting hundreds of feet literally above a floodplain, and yet they're in a floodplain. So we've got some work to do there, and we'll look forward to working with you on that. With that, without objection, all members have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which be forwarded to the witness for his response. Ask our witness to please respond promptly as you're able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion of the record. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.